Welcome to the All City Taxi Talk Show and you're about to hear some amazing stories which will blow your mind from an absolute dance legend from the 1970s who set many a dance floor on fire with his incredible moves. So please comment, like and subscribe to this channel. Press the subscribe button below down there and share this history. Share this history around the uh, socials because what you're about to hear will seriously blow you away. Peace. And I went against my, my whole <laughs> so I went, I wrote popping. P-I-P-P-I-N-G, Pete. And I stared at the paper. And I was like, oh, oh, I hate Pete. Oh, but it rings better. Poppy Pete. It's just, it's there. I've, I've upgraded the engine. I've upgraded the suspension. I've upgraded the, the chassis. And now, and, now, and now you're running on rocket fuel. Man, a man, dude. So <laughs> fan. Nice little blizzard. And I came up and said, Who you wanna you wanna dance against me? He said, Yeah. I said, Okay. I said, Who? I'm going first or you go first? And I said, Because I'm gonna beat you in five moves. On this week's show, we have an absolute dance legend who was one of the creators of the popping dance move, who is first generation member of the Electric Boogaloo's crew, which was founded in 1978 and appeared on shows like Soul Train, Midnight Special, and also uh, helped choreograph Michael Jackson's Beat It video and has worked with, you know, uh, musicians such as Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson, Gwen Stefani, Will Smith, and many, many more, and uh, who continues to this day to to help push to the next level of dance we have from london all the way over to california the one and the only popping pete in the place hey hey, hey. <laughs> yeah well, well actually i live in las vegas so i'm not in california anymore are you in las vegas now yeah. Pete, what I like to do, I love to kind of take it to the start. So we're uh, like taking it back to the root, back to where it all kind of started. So mm. the, fir the first two questions I always ask is, you know, whereabouts are you from? And what was it like growing up, you know, as a, as a kid? Well, I'm from, I'm from originally from Fresno, California, born in 61. So pretty much um, started to dance when I was five to uh, my first talent show, uh, dancing on stage was around five or six years old. And... Um, you know, it was just, you know, growing up in a black family that was poor, you know, it was just music and dance, you know, you know, singers, singers who can dance, dancers who can sing. So it was really cool growing up in the, in Fresno in, in the, the 60s and 70s. Who was basically like inspiring yourself, you know, in the early years of dance? Uh, well, you know, the first artist back then was James Brown. He, he was the, the best. He was the, the, the artist at that time that, Every dancer looked up to every, you know, because he was the capitalist. And it was other artists. You had Joe Tex. Uh, and then it's around 1968 and, and, uh, or, or about at that time, the Jackson 5 came along. And then we saw him on a show called the Ed Sullivan Show. And he introduced this, this you know, preteen and teenage uh, all-brother group that we you know, heard the music and to see. It was phenomenal, you know, so that and to watch the group doing uh, routines and choreography and looking at someone look, almost looking in America. I, I, I think I was eight and I think Michael was 10. Oh, yeah, that was quite quite a pivotal moment. Heck yeah. Mm. And um, in 1975, your brother, uh, Sam, you know, he, he basically started, you know, he started popping. Sam was just this incredible this person that understood movement and music and timing, but he would do these, you know, he'd be doing a regular dance and then he'd throw something else in it and he'd be like, oh, that's, that was different. Oh, that's his style. That's his feel. So that's why, I, so learning from, you know, when the, all this stuff developing, popping is just one singular style. It wasn't like how they have now umbrella. It's not the umbrella term. It's not saying, you know, when popping came out, because you got to say popping, uh, scarecrow, puppet, uh, boogaloo, all these things that other people created, other communities, you know, strutting and, and, and animation and stuff is, and other styles. How, how did he kind of, how did you come up with the, the, the term popping? Is it because like you're like, like, like popping out of a joint, like popping, popping movements? Well, yeah, it's just mean the, the muscle is popping out of the skin because, you know, you use your tricep, 
and and uh, your pecs. You know, and you snap your knees back, you use your neck muscle. So it's the actual of the if if the muscle can make a sound, not only the the the, the contraction of the muscles, like it's just popping. So then they just start saying as they're doing, they go, "Look at mine," you know. Um, and this is again, I wasn't there in the in the, in the conception of the development of it, but the stories that him and other people who were there, it was that they would just go pop, pop, pop. They would just say the word, but they would make it, they would make it the thing they make the, the sound or of what their muscles were doing, and that's why it's called popping to pop the muscle or just you no, know, you know, back then, you know, we we're. we're uh, the vocabulary is limited. Nobody was saying contracting the muscle. We gotta contract. Con no, tense up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can we can tense up. Yeah, but yeah, so, popping 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 sounds so much better. Yeah. And uh, the the energy of the dance is absolutely electric. So mm. you know, how how did you get your crew name, the Electric Boogaloo's? And you know, who was in the crew like in the early years? These are the guys who who made most of the, the, the structure of the moves we do, their styles and their moves. So those guys are originally from Fresno. They were called the Electronic Boogaloo Lockers. Reason why? Electronic, because it was two guys in there did the robots, so they they used electronic as being mechanical. Boogaloo was Sam of, you represent Boogaloo and Poppin. And then you had two guys that did locking style. So that's why it was called Electronic Boogaloo Lockers. Not Boogaloo's. Boogaloo. And then other guys around the neighborhood in the, in the Long Beach started to learn from Sam. And then he made a, a, a group, second group, which was an extension of the other group called, we were still called Electronic Boogaloo Rockers for Long Beach Edition. We um, ended up uh, doing an audition for a show. And one of the, uh, the men who organized the show, his name was Jeff Kutash, 1978. We Went in, we got you know we got the job, but he said I think it was too long. Plus, we're not really lockers because they had some of the original lockers in the show. So he said, I'm, I'm going to change you guys' name, and he said, um, Electric Boogaloo, not Boogaloo's, Boogaloo. So we became in 1978 the Electric Boogaloo Long Beach First Edition. Incredible, and um, also you know um, how did you get your name? You know, Poppin' Pete. Because um, back then everyone. Every dancer, if you did, you know, uh, any style, whether it be popping, scarecrow, kicking, tutting, waving, you use that, use whatever style it is to just, you know, uh, you know describe what you do with your name. You know, it's almost like being uh, being uh, superhero uh, characters or whatever with your superpowers. So, so everyone would have, you know, uh, my brother, his name is Derek, but they call him, we call him Deck. His name is Ticken Deck, Boogaloo Sam, Puppet Boozer. So anything that you did majority of is your strength and your power, like a superhero, just like Superman can fly, but Superman is also strong and also can run fast. So my name came about when, because my name is Timothy. My, what we call in America, nickname, play name, uh, is Peter Gunn. If you called me Pete, I would get very angry. Because I, that name did not suit me. Peter is, everyone in the neighborhood would call me, hey, Peter, hey, Peter. So when I started learning how to pop, I wanted a good name. So I started, I was in, I was actually in, in high school and I, I was writing, I was in my biology class and I'm writing, trying to figure out the names that I want to use. And I, I was writing Popping Timmy. No, Popping Timothy. No. Hell no. Uh, then I went, oh, I just Nickname that everyone called me, Popping Peter. Oh my God, that sounds so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> just, just imagine now, you know, people, I'm being, I'm being, uh, coming to the stage, you might do a show. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to the stage, the, you know, the incredible, uh, the Electric Boogaloo member, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Popping Peter. Peter, why? <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? doesn't work it and doesn't I and, work. And so and I went against my my whole <laughs> so I went I wrote popping p-i-p-p-i-n-g Pete and I stared at the paper and I was like oh oh I hate Pete oh but it rings better popping 
peak. It's just, it's there. <laughs> so I, after school, I came home and I remember talk. I said to Sam, I got a name. I got a name. I'm excited. I said, he said, what? I said, Popping Pete. Sam looked at me like I was like, said some foreign, had some foreign language. Like, but you don't, your name's not Pete. It's Peter. Then I said, well, say Popping Peter. He went, Popping Pete. <laughs> and the rest, the rest is history. And the, re and the rest is history. So people would see me, you know, and I wasn't great, but I'm learning, but I had the power. So I, it, I didn't have the, yet the, the total structure of the dance, but I had the foundations down. So, I mean, I can just be, <clears throat> people said, man, he pops hard. Oh, he pops so hard. Oh, yeah, and I could obviously say, oh, I'm popping hard. So, I, so people would look at that. Then I started saying, well, because the, you have to learn the pop and put it inside you. So I, when I changed my name to P-O-P, apostrophe I-N, then you had to say my name, Pop and P. Pete, I was going to say as well, you know, um, in the early days, you um, you had a lot of, an appearance on Soul Train. You know, how, how did you get your appearance on the Soul Train? Uh, 1979, this guy named Cleveland. Cleveland was performing on. He was a regular Soul Train dancer at the time, and he did an interview. And he said, Duncan said, Oh, you're doing this. Uh, I see you doing this new dance, Pop It Boogaloo for the Let's Boogaloo. And Cleveland said, Yeah. And then Don Cornelius turned to the camera and said, Yes, the Let's Boogaloo will be on the show next you know, two weeks. But we had, we was watching the show was pre taped. We were watching the show at home, and he's mentioned our name, but they had not reached out to us because they, they couldn't, they didn't know how to get in contact. He just, uh, prematurely just said that, but they went into a scramble trying to figure, find out our phone numbers because yeah, at the time it was only the landline and there was no cell phones. So we we seen the taping and that was just come on Saturday. One of the members, Robot Dane, called to the production office on Monday morning and the lady said, "Oh my God, we've been looking for you guys. You, we we need you guys on the show because Don Cornelius announced it to the world that y'all going to be on to the nation actually." So, and that's how we got on the show the very first time is through that way. And uh, we didn't even get paid the, the very first time. We, um, we got a we got a box of chicken because they would mm. feed all the no dancers on the show got paid. You know, so they would uh, in you know lunchtime they they had a they had a kind of meal deal with KFC or first it was that was Pioneer was a chicken company called Pioneer Chicken. Then it became KFC sponsored them. And then you get a box of two piece and a one can of can of um, pop. That was it. So that's how we got on the show in uh, 1978. We finished the show taping. Don Cornelius, the host, walked up to us after and said, "I want you guys on the show again. Can y'all come back next week to tape another?" So that's how we got on the show twice. And did you uh, on, the, on the on the second time? Did you get paid? Uh, yeah, we got paid. Yeah, we got paid. New union scale. We got paid, and we had a dress room. The first time we didn't have a dress room. We we all we had a change in, in the men's toilet. Uh, but we didn't care. No, hey, we on Soul Train. We didn't care about the money. It's a prestige. It was Soul Train yeah, was yeah. a premier dance show. That legendary performance that lives on through things like YouTube. You know, if you go on YouTube now and put in Electric Boogaloo's Soul Train, you know it's all there now for for the world yeah. to see. Yeah, yeah. Which is the crazy thing about that. You got to remember that's 1979. I didn't see a repeat of that until the 2000s. There was no, of course, in those days. It was one shot. If you missed us on perform, there was no there was no reruns. There was nothing of that. They never reran a Soul Train performance. But I don't I don't live the thing that I because everybody was we were still learning, so I don't live off that moment. I talk, I call it the, the I'm it's the blueprint. I'm still building. So, but a lot of people look at that era and look at that moment and say, oh, this one Poppin was at his best. No, Poppin was at his at his uh, infancy. It was the beginning. So I don't I don't look at that as the the moment because Sam was already advanced so far above us. He he watered some of his stuff down to match, but then his water down was still above what we were doing. When I look at the structure and the and and, and the, the technique and 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 all this kind of stuff, so I, I I don't look at old school moments as some. I look at it as the the door opening, not the a moment that it finds me. Mm. But to the nine in ninety two around ninety two is when I really started learning and understanding the dance. This is when I went, Oh, I now I feel this. I feel like I know the dance. 
like the foundation, but what you can do, you can also build on the foundation. Yeah, but you, that's what I mean. You have to, but you have to have something to build on. But if you, but if you look at that structure and leave it as is, again, you're going to be trying to trying to a a night say a 1980. I say when I start 1979 uh, Mercedes Benz racing a, a 2020 Mercedes Benz. Who do you think going to win? Yeah, so yeah. the foundation is there because they had to still uh, run everything and build everything on a foundation and a structure. I learned everything on the foundation. My foundation is the same, meaning, but I've I've upgraded the engine. I've upgraded the suspension. I've upgraded the the chassis. I'm I'm I'm. I still when I started learning this, I was run I was running on on, on turbo fuel. I was running just regular old petrol. But in 1978, 79. And now, and now, and now you're running on rocket fuel. Man, a man, dude. So I'm saying, <laughs> nitro glycerin. Now you, now, now, now you're on on the nitro. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, that's and this is where people gotta understand. You know, that's why I don't call myself an old school dancer. Mm. That's, that puts you in a box. I'm not an old school dancer. I'm a dancer. I'm I, I'm a dancer to to the day I quit. And we're we're, so, we're 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 all students as well, aren't we, uh, Pete? We're all students. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a student for life. Hmm. That's I've, t- I've said that many times to people when I'm they like, you're a master. I'm a, okay, I'm a, a master student. That's what you want to say, because I'm my my learning is going to continue. And you know what I love? What I love talking about as well was the fashion, because you know back in hmm. the day, you know you you looked. You you look like you was on fire. I mean, some of the some of the clothing you was wearing was was absolutely fantastic. So, were you, whereabouts was you getting your clothes from, or was you sometimes getting your clothes made? Well, I mean, the stuff we used to do that we performed the Soul Train. Well, actually, the first ones, the one in the, in the black and silver, mm. my my uh, mom made. The, wow. the ones, the second performance in the multicolor. Satin with the, with the the hat and I had on the green and white. That was made by my now my mother in law because it was my at the time my girlfriend her mom was a seamstress also. So we and those suits with the the big hat pizza hats or whatever they call them, that the pattern was that is a a clown outfit that when we went and bought the pattern. Because we would base it off the lockers, because lockers will wear these, you know, the knickers or whatever, uh, the pants. Uh, I know in, in the UK knickers is different. So the the, the pants with the little draw, uh, the little elastic at the bottom. Those they, they was that thing was a when you looked at the how to make this. It was it says clown costume. So we just and we she altered some of the stuff and the hats were clown hats, but we were trying to get the the. The, the big pizza hats that the lockers were wearing. So that's what that the multicolor uh, suits on the second performance uh, came from from my mother in law. And what what was the idea about you know tucking your 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 trousers or, or you say your pants into your socks? No, they wasn't tucked into the socks. Those were those elastic bottoms. So we 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 didn't we didn't tuck anything to our socks. That was that was for us. That was tacky. That's when people are like, oh, dude, I've seen that so many times. Like, dude, now you're just faking. Nah, my stuff was, it was made. And then we got, then later we got into uh, wearing uh, suits, you know, uh, style, you know. So. And the suit, and the suits back then, they was very, very, really baggy. Now, what, what's the reason mm-hmm. why they're baggy? Is it because when, when you do like a pop, mm-hmm. like, will, will, the, will the suit kind of, you know, it will kind of flow uh, like off yourself, so it will basically like exaggerate that move. Well, I mean, also, I mean that that too, in a sense, of course. But and comfort, and, comfort. Well, comfort because at that time, you you talking about now we're in the we're in the late seventies and eighties, wearing, you know, dancing in tight, you know, or slim pants or whatever. They be wearing now, even though that was in the sixties. So you're coming out of the sixties and the seventies. The seventies, early seventies were still form fit and tight. Even our first, actually, that's not even our first original uniform. The very first original uniform we had on these uh, black pants that was contoured to the 
buttocks. And then they flared out to what we call bell bottoms of the 70s. So they wide at the bottom and tight around the waist, crotch area. You know, like it's the disco. It's coming out of the disco era. Then into the 80s, then the, the baggy, the baggier stuff started kind of popping up. But the only reason why we wore the the big oversized uh, suits because of the the, the zoot suit era. What looking going back and watch that and actually Shabadoo uh, started dressing, which he was dressing in the in the sense of wearing the suits like Cab Calloway, uh, Nat King Cole. So that era of the forties and fifties were were the the baggier uh, suits with the pleats in the front and all that. So we when you when we saw how how dancers from that era, which some in the nineteen twenties and the thirties, how they, how especially not even that, just the, the, the we just went back and, and and adopted that into the into the into the seventies, late seventies and early eighties, because it, we call it draping. It's like when they yes, the suits are big, but they drape. Plus, I was really very very skinny, very small, so I have these these big suits, but it draped. See, music is a very, very important part that goes with the dance. So, what what would basically kind of what tracks would get you really fired up? Was was there cer certain key tracks that you'd be like, "Wow, that's it! I'm gonna like you know get on the dance floor." Yeah, of course, in the early days there were, but we also not only it wasn't not only the funk, you know, what they considered funk music. A lot of stuff was disco fusion with funk. A lot of stuff was R and B. You know, it was a lot of R&B artists that we that we danced to uh, disco R&B, um, and and most of the things that I danced to, and in those days, it was songs with lyrics. It was structured, it had a bridge, it had a breakdown. It wasn't just we instrumentals. If you heard an instrumental back in those days, it was like it was like one of those a special songs. Somebody said, "Oh, I'm gonna." You know, or it's the instrumental on the other side of the the, the, the original, because like especially what just George Clinton did for the Parliament and, and Funkadelic, he would put uh, like song needy, not just needy, we so needy. Side, it's the instrumental, but we were pretty much dancing to the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So you know, now it's now it's mostly in, instrumental driven with people Dean Poppy. Uh, back then it was it was R and B. It was disco fusion funk. It was funk music. Uh, so anything with a with a, a good beat, man, I've danced. I've danced to it. Obviously, with the dance as well. Did you get involved with any kind of like fierce battles with with any other crews, or wasn't it wasn't it really like that back then? Oh, um, no, I was. That's a, that's how you that's how you got your reputation. There was no. There was you couldn't just. I mean, again, there was no social media, so you can just put some clip up somewhere and, and hopefully somebody seen it and like it and comment. There was nothing like that. You, it was live comments. If someone saw you dancing, they didn't like you. They say you suck. It's the same thing about right now. You can write that on a, somebody's comment, you suck or you ain't good. Uh, you know, it's the same thing. Now you're just doing it instantly. So the difference back then was to get a reputation, regardless if it's, if it's a reputation of you got beat several times, you can get that reputation. Oh, he got turned out we we never said battle and from the same i didn't hear about the word battling until the 90s that wasn't uh the west coast terminology we said if you want to go we said you want to dance against me want to go against me you want to you want to go you can you you know you want to get out get out i mean what's just i think i'm saying back you want to get out so those are the that's how you got repetition and the battles or uh, get downs or go against me moments were epic because it, some of them came out of nowhere. Because something, it's times that uh, it's two incidents, well, three incidents that happened to us as electric boogaloo. Someone actually came to our, because we at the when our parents came to our family home, knocked on the door, and asked my and said to my mom, "Oh, we're here to battle your sons." And we was already in the in the garage where we had converted that into a practice dojo or whatever. And these two brothers came. Battles. They didn't win, but they they came. But they wow. knocked on the door. They knocked on the door. The second one, uh, second incident happened to me, where someone, one of my friends, came to my house. Came to my, I was in a, in a flat apartment, 
I'm with my parents and he's and I was sick. This is when I first started learning. I was probably like three months into it. Someone said, Hey, this guy wanna this, this kid on it. We was all young. I'm 16, he's probably the same age. And other think the other guy was 15. He wants to battle you. And I say, Where is he? Yeah, oh, he lives, you know, well for us we say four blocks, which is probably like a quarter of a mile or the less, you know, if we going so I didn't have a, I'm not driving. I don't have a bike. So I ran. So it was probably like a, like a seven minute, eight minute run to his neighborhood, to his home. And I ran up, saw him, his little sister, his pet, his mom was in in their front yard. And I came up, I said, oh, you want to, you want to dance against me? He said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, who I'm going first or you go first. And I said, because I'm going to beat you in five moves. And I saw I was braggadocious then. And then he started, you know, he wasn't good because the dance, so he only was mimicking what he saw everyone else did that was a watered down version of what I did and what we were doing, which mm-hmm. I was doing a, 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 a learning interpretation of what Sam was teaching me. So by the time it got to a lot of people, it was not as good. So I I did five moves and I beat him. And I said, and he was honest. Now to his mom, I said, did I win? And he said, yeah. And I ran back home. And what was the uh, what was the third? The third is when I was 36, 38 years old, 36, 38, somewhere like this, living here in Long, uh, Las Vegas. My little cousin was in high school at the time, and he called me on their lunch break. And he said, hey, cousin, someone up here said they can beat you popping. And I, at a high school, I said, really? I think, and my son at the time was 11 years old. I said, let's go, son. I said, now I'm you, I'm 38 years old. This is high school. I got in my car, drove across town, pulled up into the lot. I see a bunch of kids on lunch break. And I came out and my cousin may say, he's over there. I went over there and said, who want, who want to, and that's now we speak, we saying that we're using the word battle because it's like, uh, this is like, uh, so to the 90s, it's probably like 99, maybe or 99 or 2000. And I said, he said him. I said, okay. So I went, do you want me to go? Or you, because I always, I'm polite like that. I'm going, but I usually go first. I, I love going first. You want to go first? I, he said, I'll go. All his friends, all the students, all the, they, he goes, and he doing all the stuff. They, oh, goody, oh my God. Ah. And he stopped and pointed at me. And I looked and I said, are you ready? He said, yeah. <laughs> I went ballistic. He's only, you gotta remember, I'm 38. He's 17, 16 or 17. I don't care. You wanna battle me? This is what we do. I have no mercy. I've been like that all my life. Learning this dance. I, at 16, I'm going, I'm just gonna go back and go back forward. 16, I'm battling, you know, people who are 12, who's, they learning, they they little girls, little kid boys. I don't care. This is a dance. You step into the octagon, you don't have to get burnt up. That's how I look. That's how I was taught. So I did my thing, and now all the students are doing. They they they're they're you know they cheering me. So when I start doing all this stuff, all these ground moves, I back and I do all kind of ground stuff. They, this is how they was looking. <laughs> and I'm looking and I'm and I think we did did two rounds and he and then and I, then I, then I came out about to go out again he said and he said oh then I said so we finished and he said yeah I said and I don't ask the crowd I ask the person I don't need to ask the crowd did I did, did you do you feel you win or did I win he said you won you only won because you're a professional dancer that's what he said I said oh dude, really? that's what we gonna do <laughs> And then the next thing you know, because it's a crowd of crowd of people, here comes the the instructor, principal instructor. She comes over there, hey, hey, stop it. Like this is almost like a big fight is what it look like. And I'm in the middle, because now we we ain't now we just talking just regular right, right at the end. And she's saying, What's going on here? God then the, the I guess the bell had already sounded for them to go to go to their next class after lunch. Get to the class, let's go, get out of here. What's... And then she turned to me. This lady, grown lady, I'm grown. She turned to me and looked me in the eye and said, whatever high school you come from, and she said, do you go here? I said, no. She said, whatever high school you come from, you need to go back. 
And, my, and I remember my son, who was 11, looked at me like, <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Can you be in high school? I said, Shh. Because I was nervous. I'm a, I can't be on a campus. Especially, I'm a grown man, balanced, come on in. I'm 36. Yeah. And uh, I said, I went this. Yes, ma'am. I'm going. I'm going to go back. I got my way home. Like I'm a grown. My, my son laughed about that for a year. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a high school student. <laughs> That's brilliant. What a brilliant story. Going back to Soul Train, actually. I mean, Michael Jackson. Um, see your incredible performance on Soul Train. Was you brought in to uh, help cho choreograph the Speed It video? Uh, no. Are you was a uh, 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 Michael didn't didn't particularly see us on Soul Train. He saw Casper, Cooley, and Jeffrey Daniels. That's mm -hmm. that's when he he saw. I'm pretty sure he. I'm talking about the day it was taped. He didn't see because he never. When I met him, he never mentioned that. I'm pretty sure he's seen a tape of it of us later. Now and then, plus when he started learning how to do. We deemed the backslide and the moonwalk. He learned both dance styles of dance moves simultaneously. He he named he reversely named the backslide the moonwalk. That's not the moonwalk is when you when you see him doing it in a circle, mm -hmm. slow. That's the moonwalk. So, and he was taught by Casper and Cooley. When I got a chance to work with him on beating, we was hired because one of the original Soul Train dancers I was working at. The production office, his production office, and she, and we at this time we staying with we were staying with Jeffrey Daniels at his home, and they they knew we were staying there. They called, and uh, they said Michael Michael Jackson, this is so now this is my, she said this is MJJ Productions. I didn't know. I said who? She said oh, Michael Jackson Production. I'm going. And I had a phone. <laughs> I said oh, excuse me. I went to the couple of guys. I said hey. I think this is a prank call. They said, what do you mean? Because somebody said they called from Michael Jackson Production. They said MJJ Production. Who is MJJ? I didn't know his name was Joseph. I didn't know his middle name was Joseph. So I'm going, I'm saying, what is the extra J for? Michael Joey Jackson? I don't know. So I hung up. I, I said it was a prank. They called back and the lady said, oh, uh, well, something happened to us. Oh, no, 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 and she said, yeah, Michael wants you guys to do this new uh, the electric balloons. Uh, you know, you guys are like, well, I said, yeah, this is Papa P. She said, hey. And I said, who is this? She said, oh, this is Cheryl. Cheryl was one of my original soul training dancer. Actually, she was the the, the first non-black, one of the first non-blacks. And she was the first Korean dancer. It was a girl. You watch the old soul train. She had the very long hair. Um, and her name is Cheryl Song. So when she said, this is Cheryl Song, I went, oh, this is not fake. So that's when we, so that, and then she said, Michael wants to hire you guys to do this new video called Beat It. And we was like, which was, uh, when I, you know, I got the album before. Beat It was the far the worst song on the album for me. I hated that song. I know people going to say, Beat, huh? That's the album. I wasn't used to rock and dun, dun, dun. I was like, hey, what the hell is going on? I was, it, it was like, this is not the Michael Jackson. I know. So, um, we, but we got, you know, we got hired a, okay, working with Michael, he, he could, he, he could have just said the song is, uh, somebody beating on a can and he was singing. I'd been like, cool, let's go. So how much you guys want to charge? Well, how much you guys charge for per day to do it? You know, huh? Wait, wait, you want us to give you our price? Like, I'm, I'm shell shocked. Like, I don't, uh, so I'm going, hold on. Hey, 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 God, he's asking how much. How much we gonna charge? And everybody, oh, 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 oh. I'm going, I'm not, we don't have a manager. We're not a manager. It's just me and, and the other guys trying to figure it out. I said, so I'm like, okay, hey, I'm gonna say $500 a day each person. Everybody's like, oh, boy, So I was like, reluctant, got a manager. Uh, Five five hundred dollars a day each person. She said, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! So I put the phone. Say, she said yes, and somebody said, "You should have asked for more." <laughs> when I asked you how much, you, you act like you didn't know. You like, oh, I don't know. So 
that's how we got the job. And then we ended up, we had to do a meet and greet with Michael pre, uh, pre uh, rehearsal. I think it was about a week and a half after we agreed to it. And he wanted us to meet up with all the street dancers because it was just really, it was just me who was there, me, Sugar Pop. And actually, we wasn't even in the metric group. It was, we was just in a group called Eclipse. We was in a group that Jeffrey Daniels was a singing dance group that we ended up go, going to uh, UK trying to get a record deal. We started living, we, I think we lived in the UK for about four months. So, um, and this was in a, in, a, in right, at, at, literally right after that. This is like 81. And probably, um, anyway, so we was in a group. So they hired me, all the people who was at the house, me, Sugar Pop, uh, Casper, Robot Dane, who else was there? Stoney Jackson, he was just an actor, but he got in. And so he wanted to do his meet and greet. And um, we went to the studio and Michael Jackson came and it was the most whew, surreal moment of my life. Like, because I had always told people, one day I'm going to Michael Jackson, you know, some streets bragging to friends, put down the unit and came and they said, have you met Michael Jackson yet? Oh, no, not yet, but one day I'm going to work with him. Not even, have no inclination of how that was going to happen. So when the opportunity came, and he, he, I don't remember, he walked in. We in the studio, it was five or six of us in the studio waiting. Here comes his security guard. We knew his security guard because he's very famous. Um, Bill Bray, Bill Bray, uh, he passed away years ago. Oh, he's an old, older man now. He walked in, he looked. He said, hey, guy. Said he walked out. I said, hey, come out there, security, security guy. Door comes, <laughs> smoke. Late, like laser lights, lights flash. <laughs> Michael Jackson walks in like, like he's floating. And I'm at the piano. And I'm, I don't know how to play, but I'm at the piano. Now my mouth is like, walk, he's walking on the But I'm looking at the back. He walks, smoke. Gets to the middle of the floor, and he says, I well, thank you guys for doing my video. And nobody's seen me. They're like, oh, that's Michael Jackson. Oh, oh my God, he's shorter than I thought he was. <laughs> that's what my head was like, oh, oh my God. Because I'm like, at the time, six, one and a half, two. He's, he's like five, eight, five, nine. Well, he's shorter than I thought. <laughs> But I'm freaking stone faced. <laughs> he says all he does in the Now let me let me let me go let me kind of rewind it because you I know the people out there thinking you're thinking smoke, laser lights, walking in slow motion. It was all in my head. That's what it appeared to me when he walked in. I was like, this isn't real. This man floated in. In my head, I seen all of that. Cause when he, it, it was an aura. He walked in like, oh, God, I like. Then he sat next to me. I'm on the piano. Now he, now he, now he, got the man, everybody know everybody name. He sits next to me and say, Pete, do you want to play? This is me. That's how I looked at him. So if he was this way, I went to No, it's my own idea. I'm looking at him with my mouth open. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. What 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 did Michael say to you then? Oh he he, oh, he laughed. Yeah. He, he laughed. Oh. He, you know, he got up and he was like, you No, know, you know, it was a brief moment, you know, probably like he was like about thirty minutes. He just wanted to meet everyone, you know. Especially because he heard of us and, and he loves street dancers and he just wanted to meet all the street dancers gonna be a part of the thing. So and that's how we got in the in the video beat it. Yeah, abs abs absolutely incredible. I, I love I love that history, Pete. Absolutely Oh true. man. It, it, was, it was and then I got to work with him in eighty five on Captain EO. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was incredible. You know, um, to do that. And I worked with him one on one also. So yeah. 
Yeah. And got the and the thing is I got to talk to him. Like at the at the video beat it in in the early in the eighties something. Well, I mean it was all eight, early eighties, but it was, uh, it was, he talked to us. He did you know he wanted us to always dance and on the set for his friends who would come to visit all his superstar star friends that would come visit him at the set. Uh, you know people like uh, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Quincy Jones, uh, Barbara Streisand, uh, George Lucas, uh, Carrie Fisher, uh, all these people. Come in there and then buy his trailer. Then he would call me, go by day in the ship pop, and say, Hey guys, can you dance for uh, my friends? Can you dance for Quincy Jones? Can you dance for Barbara Streisand? Can you dance? And we over there popping, and he's in the window of his trailer going, like, excited. Oh, but I see you guys. I told you, these guys are incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, so it was magic moments in that. Abs- abs- absolutely incredible. And a big, uh, big RIP to, uh, to Michael as well. Oh, yeah, no doubt, man. Mm. When was the first time Pete, you went to London? Because I know you was there in 1983. Yeah, right. Yeah. And who did you come come with? Was it Robot Dane and Sugar Pop? It was me, Robot Dane, Sugar, Sugar Pop, Skeeter Rabbit, mm-hmm. uh, a, a girl named Brenda, and Casper. Casper is named Jerome Kennedy. He's the he's the guy who taught Michael Jackson the backside. He was hired to uh, show him that in 1980. He didn't deb- de- debut the move until uh, 83 on the Motown 25th anniversary. He already knew how to do it two years pr- prior to that. And how, and how did you feel when you first come to London? Did you um did you go to Covent Garden? Because um, I heard yeah. that you, you hooked up with some of our B-boys and puppers back in Covent. Yeah, I mean, you know, in those days, I was still young in, in, uh, in the UK. Cause Jeffrey Daniels was coming over, and everybody, and then everybody started calling it in the UK body popping. We was like, mm. we heard that. We was like, it's not called body popping. What is that? We was like, I remember Skeeter Rapper was like, hey, come on, body popping. Who said that? He said Jeffrey Daniels, because guess he was on the show with Top of the Pops, and they start, and here was the body popping. We know, body popping. Like, we hated that name. And, um, so we had Covenant and Garden and, and um, many other places. We would go and just show up because they say, this is where dancers are. And uh, breaking had, you know, breaking was, was in, its, in its beginning stages in the, in the UK at this time too. Seeing, you know, of course, close to New York and California. So that's, and then what they seen on, when they seen the movement of what they call electric boogie or that movement coming out of New York, that's what they were most see doing from the video footage that they saw uh, uh, of early music video artists. When we came doing the way we did it, it was different. So they was like, what is this? Uh, it's called popping and boogling. So they were like, oh my God, like we don't know. Again, we was in a group called Eclipse. We only told people, yeah, we from a group called Electric Boogie, but the group, this group you see right here is Eclipse. We're a singing dance crew that was trying to get a record deal in London. and. Um, so, but yeah, we met, you know, a lot of, you know, the people I know now that, you know, they were, you know, I'm, I think I was 20, somewhere like that, 20 years old. Most of the people were like 16, and it was young, young, young kids. We, I mean, we all was young, but they were young, so still teenagers. So uh, I see a lot of them. I still know. Now they're, they all in their 50s, or early 50, mid, <laughs> mid, I'm going. Dude, you're you now you're old grown man. Before you was this little kid talking to grown men, me, Skeet Rabbit, shit. You know, Sugar Bob was actually about there. Sugar Bob was 17, 18 when he was there. So I loved every part of being in, in, in London and all that. Piccadilly Square was my ultimate favorite place. Piccadilly, Piccadilly Circus. Yeah. Circus, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Piccadilly Circus was my favorite place to go. The West End was was the most fascinating. <laughs> it was, you know, this is we was there when the height of the, the punk rock scene and the, uh, all that stuff. So, did you uh, did you ever get in a black cab? Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, I listen think. when when you come to London next, when all these things at the way, whenever you come to London, make sure you get in touch with me, and I will take you on a personal trip in my black cab and take you around mm-hmm. all the spots. Hey man, that that'd be lovely. We were so fascinated with black 
black cabs, you know, especially that and in, in, in those days where the seat fold down and the thing fuck we like and so much room in the back. We like, what is this? We can get ten people in here. Uh, it was <laughs> the greatest experience, bruh. Like hey, for a, hmm. Pete, do you know the reason why in a black cab that the uh, the ceiling is so high? Why? Because back in the day, uh, when people used to get in with their bowler hats and their top hats, they didn't have to take their hats off. So they could just get straight into the cab. That makes sense, dude. Yeah. I, that's what we was tripping off of. We was like, like, why is it so high? Is it because tall people? Is it because of this? But we would, and we would pretty much only ride in black cabs because we was fascinated. We just like the, the and... <clears throat> But it, it was a it was the very best experience, and then we got to perform at the um, carnival, the not New Carnival. Not yet, not yes. Oh my god! Mm. I, I heard, I heard yeah. about, I heard about the story at Not in Hill Carnival. You blew everyone away with your dance routine. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. So that yeah, was a, a the most craziest experience because you know again, people start hearing them. Uh, even if you again knowing who we were. As an electric blues, as his dance, it just in that moment when we went there, we and I remember they was DJing underneath the bridge on top of this structure that bird crap and everything. We yeah so yeah yeah. I, th- I think I think so, that was I think that was Mastermind yeah. Mastermind Roadshow that yeah. we DJ. Yep. Yeah. So we ended up going up to me, Sugar Pop, and, and uh, Skeeter Rabbit went up on the thing and danced for the crowd down below. They absolutely. Absolutely, and the crazy thing is, we had a a driver car because we the drivers there, you know. And when we came down, we was mobbed, and uh, we had a, we had hired a this I forgot his name. He's a little uh, it was an older man. I mean, you know, in his he was twenty, he probably in his forties. He was our bodyguard. Everybody just swarming, and we had to run to the to the, the waiting uh, car and he, he was just and he, trying to push everybody back and throwing this all in the thing and we got got away but it was that was the, the most craziest thing but a lot of people don't know that when we we you know we was there for again the singing and dance group called eclipse we would go to all the clubs now back then this is when uh george michael uh, I mean, you know, Wham, Boy George, Kaja Guru, you know, many, you know, all the top, you know, bands and groups at that time of the UK that, you know, the whole London invasion in the midst of that. So we would go to all these circus circus, um, to, uh, I mean, all these big clubs that was going on. So when we started developing our show and we got hired to open on three, it was three different venues to open up for Wham, George Michael and, and Andrew. We open up for them, and we that was. And I remember we walked out, and we're now we're actually singing. It's live. We're you know the lead sing. We we Skeeter Rabbit, Sugar Pop, Robot Dang. We back. We doing the back thing, doing routines. We you know we it's a group, and they. And I remember the the, the kids rushed. The stage. I mean, you know, we all young too. They rushed the stage, front of the stage, and they started beating on the stage with their hands, like people. <laughs> and and we was like, "What the hell?" And we on stage performing. And I, as Skeeter Rabbit said, he was guy. He got so angry that he wanted to fight because he was thinking they on the stage just be- beating on the stage. And we finished the show. I don't even did like three songs. We came back to the dressing room. We told the organizer, and I remember he said, "Hey, y'all, why y'all stop him from hitting the stage? You know, I st-. and he's terrible. The man looked at us like you dumb." That he said they beating on the stage because they appreciate it. And they they like what they see. That's how they show their appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> All banging on the stage, yeah. Yeah, we was like, <laughs> oh, and then then we did. Uh, other venues, the and that's they would some would come up and do it. We were happy. Oh, they like us. 
but um, that was one of the highlights. So. And um, I know I'd love to talk to you a lot longer. I mean, I've got so many more questions, Pete, but I know we're kind of pushed for time. But let's kind of end it on this kind of note. Is there kind of um, any great advice that you could give to up and coming dancers? Hey, man, the only thing I, I can give is, you know, dance for the love. Dance for the love of. Now, I'm not saying dance for the love and not get paid. If you, if you make it, it's two different things. You, if you're trying to make this your career, make sure you know your worth. If you're trying to, if you still, you know, because love, the love of the dance goes with being paid or unpaid. My whole thing is, is, is to, if you're going to do something, especially like this, do it for the love. If you do it, make sure if you're getting paid, make sure you're getting paid your, your, your money's worth and who you are. Uh, but also, you know, learn it, learn whatever dance you're doing or styles you're doing, learn them from, you know, from the factual history of it, you know, because it's a lot of, and, and you know, now it's, it's, uh, it's so much bad information, bad information to some people. It's like, this is, the, oh yeah, this is, right. this is so true. But it's like, because there's just so much going on. You got to filter and weed through the, through the crap, through that crab grass, through them. So, uh, but you know, I always tell, it's me. I, I, the love of the dance is the reason why I'm still here. Mm. Uh, it's my career is what my career because this is my profession. But the only way I can still do what I do, I have to love what I do, and I love what I do because that's how I, I came in, learned this dance when I first saw it. I fell in love with the movement and the feel of what was how it was being structured. So once you and once you you lose the love of it, you 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 lose the drive for it. Now, and 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 it, it happens quite often to everyone. A lot of people who started back in my day, at the same time or shortly after, stopped dancing because they they, they it wasn't something that they found a career. Everybody have a passion for dance. You can everybody gonna move everything. But I made this. I made this my lifestyle. This is it's a DNA for me. It's my it's part of who I am. So, um, but and it also. Got to practice hard, man. Never, never stop practicing. Never stop working on your fundamentals. Never stop working on uh, uh, sharpening your tools. Because if you think because someone calls you a master or a legend, and you think you can be, you can get caught slipping. <laughs> caught slipping means, you know, not even in a battle sense. It's just in a mentality of it. My thing is, I'm gonna always stay sharp. Because I, I look at the, I look at the dance as I'm learning. Also, you're 60 next year, and you don't look a day older than 40. <laughs> if I cut this gray off, I look, I look like I'm in the 30s. Well, you can give but, it uh, uh, give it a little bit of a dye, you know, around the sides. No, uh, yeah, I used to, but uh, now I just leave it like this. You, you just know, you, you like, just rock it, rock the silver, yeah, rock the silver style. And I don't really like gray. I never uh, gray was when I growing up like gray. I see all the people with gray, and I'm 16. I say I'm never gonna do that. Uh, it looks okay, you know. But I, you know, I wish I wish this was more gray. Just want to stay this black. I don't know now. I look like a like a raccoon or something. Nah, Pete. Listen, you look you look you look absolutely incredible. You know, considering you're going to be the big six zero next year. And yeah. listen, all, all I can say is what an honor for you to do this as well. I'm blown away with the history. Oh man, I mean, anytime, man. You know, I got I got you got more questions. I got more answers. I I can talk since we can't then yeah, we can do a part two don't make no difference yeah listen what what we'll do we're planning a part two because i've still got a few more questions i'd love to ask you but obviously time's running out but pete all i can say is respect my man same steve man it was my pleasure doing this you know anytime you know when i'm in and uh, uh, when i get back to to london uh, at that black cab ride I'm, uh, I'm definitely gonna hold you to it and uh we're gonna get it in Listen, the, uh, the the cab is waiting for you at Heathrow. I'll be picking you up and taking you on tour. Don't worry about that. Yes. <laughs> All right, Pete. Peace, my man. Peace out, Steve. Take care, bro. Be safe out there, man. You know, they, I got that new new stuff going on around there. No, you too. Yeah, no, no. Okay. You too, my man. You, you, uh, okay. you, you keep safe. Okay. All right, Steve. Peace.